Today we're going to continue our exploration of option E with lesson E4, neurotransmitters and synapses. The good news about this lesson is we have covered uh, a significant portion of this when we studied uh, neurotransmission and the nervous system. What happens if you put a positive charge and a negative charge close to each other? Will they be attracted or will they repel? The answer is that opposites attract. And if you put a positive and negative charge near each other, they will move towards each other. When we're talking about neurons and neurotransmission and membrane potential, we have a default situation set up where you have ne an, an overall negative charge on the inside of the nerve and an overall positive charge on the outside of the nerve. Now they're obviously attracted to each other but they don't move towards each other because there are gated ion channels which are closed in the plasma membrane of the cell uh, when, when a nerve is not being stimulated. So that's what we call resting potential. If you look on this graph you'll see a dotted line that's labeled threshold. Resting potential occurs below the threshold and what that means is that the positive and negatively charged areas are separated and they're unable to move towards each other. When you reach that dotted line or the threshold what's happening there is that you've stimulated that neuron enough such that those gated ion channels are opening up and allowing movement of the charges towards each other. And it happens sort of in a one-two punch. When you see that first shoot up past the threshold up to the action potential, that's because um, the sodium ion channels are opening up and positively charged sodium ions are flowing into the inside of the neuron. Then those close and then the potassium gated ion channels open up and potassium flushes out. And that's when you see that that spike start to move down because as the positive charge is leaving the inside of the neuron it's becoming more and more negatively charged and it's coming down. Uh, and then when those gated ion channels closed uh, you, ha you end up, from a charge perspective, having the same situation as you did before that nerve was even stimulated you ha with having um, negative charge on the inside and positive charge on the outside, but the sodium and potassium are in the wrong place. They're in op opposing places, which is why it's called a hyperpolarization. So the point here being that before a neuron is stimulated, when it's in uh, location A and it's at resting potential, that's when all the channels are closed and there is a membrane potential. There's a differential between the inside and the outside, the, outs the outside being positive, the inside being negative. Once you pass the threshold, which is point B, the channels open and you start to have a neutralization of the differential between the outside and the inside of the neuron and this happens by positively charged sodium ions rushing in. Uh, and then it shoot the inside, all, this whole graph is with respect to the inside of the neuron, so the inside of the neuron gets increasingly more positively charged, which is why you see that spike go up. And then when those sodium ion channels close and the potassium ones open, you have an influx of potassium K plus going inside, and so the inside, which was um, now, and so the inside of the neuron is becoming less and less positive becoming more negative which brings you through point D to point E at which point the K plus ion channels close and you have a hyperpolarization you have an overall differential negative charge on the inside of the neuron with uh, respect to the outside however the sodium is on the inside and the potassium is on the outside and after that uh, hyperpolarization that's when you have uh, the sodium potassium pumps which will then pump the sodium potassium back to their natural position and you will return to resting potential. This slide addresses how the central nervous system and decision making in the central nervous system can result from the interaction between both excitatory and inhibitory presynaptic neurons at synapses. So let's identify what we're looking at here in this picture. What color is the presynaptic neuron or neurons in this picture? 
The answer is they are yellow. Is there one presynaptic neuron or more than one? In this picture, there are more than one. You can see there are multiple yellow presynaptic neurons. Now, what is that white space that goes in between the yellow and the peach-colored neuron? That's the synaptic cleft, and that's where the neurotransmitters are released. What's the difference between this picture and other pictures that we've looked at um, with a synapse in between two neurons? Is that normally we just look at one presynaptic neuron, the synaptic cleft, and its impact on the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and in this case, we are sort of zooming out and, and taking into account the fact that that postsynaptic neuron, or the peach-colored one here in the center, actually has interactions not just with one presynaptic neuron, but multiple. It can have uh, interactions with hundreds of presynaptic neurons. And just because all of those are um, colored yellow and that they're all considered presynaptic neurons, they may not all be the same type of neuron and synaptic cleft. Some of them might be dopamine receptors, some of them might be um, serotonin receptors, some of them might be norepinephrine receptors, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the sum total of the effect of all these pre whether or not enough stimulation is occurring such that it's going to pass through the threshold and perpetuate an action potential. How does this work in reality? Well, let's just, for uh, argument's sake, let's circle the top three yellow presynaptic neurons. And let's say that, that these synapses are excitatory in nature. In other words, if these yellow presynaptic neurons are stimulated, and if they release neurotransmitters via exocytosis into those three synaptic clefts, those neurotransmitters are going to dock to receptor sites on the postsynaptic dendrite, and they're going to contribute to the push or the perpetuation of crossing the threshold of synaptic transmission. So they're going to be um, contributing towards the nervous impulse continuing down the next neuron. Now let's circle the five presynaptic yellow neurons that are on the bottom, and let's categorize those as inhibitory in nature. So in other words, if these five yellow neurons are um, uh, stimulated and the stimulation reaches the axon terminal and they release their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft and they dock with their receptor sites on the dendrites on the bottom part of that neuron, those are actually going to be inhibitory in nature, which means that instead of pushing the signal, they are going to pull back the signal. It's kind of like trying to push your door open and then having someone hold the door closed by hanging onto the doorknob. So you're pulling back Let's just um, arbitrarily using the raw numbers that we used here. If we have three presynaptic neurons that are excitatory in nature and one, two, three, four, five neurons that are inhibitory in nature, what's going to be the net result? Are we going to have more excitatory activity or more net inhibitory activity? The answer is going to be more inhibitory activity so that even though this particular nerve is being stimulated by three um, presynaptic neurons, the fact that it's being inhibited by five presynaptic neurons keeps the membrane potential below the threshold and prevents synaptic um, transmission from perpetuating to that next neuron. How does this connect to drugs and the effect of drugs on the brain, particularly psychoactive drugs? Well, what psychoactive drugs do, whether you're talking about marijuana or cocaine or benzodiazepines or, or anything for that matter, um, is they vary the impact of neurotransmitters that are in the synaptic cleft and how well they impact um, the receptor sites on the postsynaptic neuron. So certain drugs are known to be excitatory in nature. In other words, they magnify or perpetuate the impact of the existing neurotransmitters that you have. Other drugs are known as inhibitory in nature, so they're going to exacerbate the neurotransmitter effect, but the effect is inhibition. three excitatory psychoactive drugs that we want to talk about are nicotine, 
cocaine, and amphetamines. So nicotine is going to stimulate alertness in memory. It may also cause some nausea and vomiting, but it is a stimulator. It's excitatory in nature, and it's going to take whatever neural impulses that are being transmitted in your brain and magnify them. It's an upper. The same thing with cocaine and crack. It's going to increase your heart rate, your respiration rate, and your alertness. And the same thing with amphetamines or ecstasy. Uh, these are also a stimulant, um, which on the negative side in extremes can cause anxiety and psychosis. Now, if they're all excitatory in nature, the question is, what's the difference between them? What's the difference between nic nicotine and cocaine uh, and amphetamines, in particular ecstasy? And the answer is that they're all excitatory in different parts of the brain, and they particularly act on different nerves that are known for different neurotransmitters. For example, one of them could act on dopamine, one of them could act on serotonin, and one of them could be excitatory for norepinephrine. Or, or in combinations of those. On the flip side of that, let's talk about three inhibitory drugs. So these are all drugs that are going to exaggerate neurotransmitters that inhibit synaptic transmission. And the first one is benzodiazepines, so Xanax, lorazepam, Ativan. Um, you may or may not have heard of these drugs, but all of these um, are muscle re relaxants and anti-anxiety drugs. That's one category. The second category of inhibitory drugs is cannabis, which is THC, found in cannabis sativa, which is the genus species name for the marijuana plant, the neuron and the receptor sites. So it's inhibitory from a neurotransmitter perspective, and cannabis and alcohol each act on different neurotransmitters, and one of those neurotransmitters might be excitatory in nature, and one might be inhibitory. So if you inhibit an excitatory neurotransmitter, you're inhibiting, but if you inhibit an inhibitory neurotransmitter, you're actually exciting, if that makes any sense. And if not, ask me about it in class, and I'll be happy to clarify further. Or I'll try at least. This particular slide wants you to know specifically which neurotransmitters are impacted by THC, THC being the main ingredient in marijuana and in cocaine. And you can see to the right, um, there are some diagrams of the molecular structure of these two psychoactive drugs. THC increases the release of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, and the place where it increases dopamine release is in the area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Cocaine blocks dopamine uh, uh, reuptake, which allows the dopamine to actually, so it's not that it's increasing the release of dopamine, but the, the dopamine that's released is staying in the synaptic cleft longer before it goes back into the presynaptic neuron via endos endocytosis, and therefore that has the same uh, ultimate effect, uh, which is uh, an increase in dopamine transmission, which leads us to the whole concept of addiction. You know, I like to, when I, when I talk to teenagers about drug experimentation and, and all the things that you're exposed to during your teen years, the analogy I, li I like to use is it's kind of like Russian roulette. So there may be six chambers and there's one bullet and you spin the chamber and, and if you're going to experiment with psychoactive drugs, you don't know if you have the bullet in your chamber or if you're gonna shoot a blank because you don't know if you're genetically predisposed to become addicted to a psychoactive drug that you experiment with. Maybe there's an 80% chance that you won't and that you'll try something and say, ugh, oh, I don't like that and you won't become addicted to it. But maybe there is also a probability that you have this genetic predisposition and that if you experiment with a certain drug that you will very easily become addicted. It's a very complicated science. Um, and there's really no way to know which drugs you may be at risk to becoming addicted to. Uh, we haven't developed those tests um, very conclusively yet. But the thing to be aware of is that, that addiction can run in families. It certainly doesn't mean that if you have a parent or a relative who is an alcoholic that you're doomed or destined to be an alcoholic. I am absolutely not saying that. I'm saying be aware of all the factors and the variables that might influence you personally. And if uh, drug or alcohol addiction runs in the family, it's something that you want to keep on your radar screen and be alert about. Uh, 